All right, um, I'm going to introduce, I'm Tandy A, and this is Jonathan Avila, and go ahead. Tandy to Boyko Llewellyn. All right. So uh, as a disclosure, um, we just want to make sure that we can't be uh, discussing any individual cases or hypothetical um, scenarios or therapy plans, but we're uh, more than welcome to answer any of your questions. And the information that we're going to be provided will need to be individualized for your child or your adolescent. And then, of course, you should discuss any of your concerns with your uh, providers. Okay. And this is not the LGBTQ equivalent class of the Heart to Heart program. So how many people went to Heart to Heart? Do you remember? Um, it was like dads with boys or <laughs> um, moms with uh, girls that just talk about puberty and changes. And we have uh, Mary here who's one of our instructors from Heart to Heart, okay? Um, I also just wanted to take a moment to ask you what, um, you know, what brings you here and what, what grade are you in, uh, for the adolescents, not the parents, uh, what brought you here, whether you wanted to come or mom brought you or, yeah, right now it's all moms, and uh, what would you like to have covered and then so that we get to know you a little bit. So we'll go through what we had prepared and then afterwards we're here for you to answer any questions and even during, if you, you know, think of a question, feel free to stop us and ask, okay? Um, so puberty is a time of development, okay, so we have physical development, there's social development, interaction with peers, adults, and teachers, and then the brain development, kind of emotional and the changes that will happen. And using that uh, guideline, what we've done is we have three uh, specialists. So I'm a hormones doctor, so I'll be kind of talking about the hormonal changes that happen during puberty. And with adolescent medicine, um, and I'll, I'll focus on the medical aspect of um, LGBTQ health. And I'm a clinical psychologist, so I'll talk a little bit more about the psychosocial aspects of LGBTQ emotional, psychological health, and family health. So uh, sex and gender basics. So we've got pictures, and then we're going to be matching with different definitions so that we all are kind of using the same similar terms. So sex is something that gets assigned, male or female, usually based on the physical anatomy when you're born. So just kind of going back, you know, you have a baby and usually the first three words that you hear are it's a boy or it's a girl based on genitalia, okay? Sometimes there are incidences where it might be difficult to know, but that usually gets assigned. So we like to say that sex is something that's assigned as male or female. So as an individual, you were assigned something. You didn't have that say right when you were born. Gender identity, however, is what you feel internally, which is a lot more important because that's where you have this feeling and you know what you're feeling and your identity and you can advocate for yourself and say, this fits with me, doesn't fit with me, this is how I'm feeling and advocate and ask um, either you know, your peers, your parents, medical community for help if you're gonna need to affirm who you are. So that's gonna be under gender identity. And it's just more than being male or female because there could be a whole spectrum of where you are and you don't necessarily need to be, and we'll show you in a picture, binary, but you could be on a continuum. Gender expression is deciding the externally how you want to show yourself as masculine or feminine or somewhere in between and it's kind of how you wear your gender, why I decided to dress the way I did today or why you're wearing what you are or your hair, um, perhaps your nails, your shoes, okay, that's all about um, your expression. And then the last thing is the sexual orientation or the attraction and behavior, who you're attracted to, who you may love, who you know, you're gonna wanna have uh, sexual encounters with, okay? So it's very different and I think um, it used to be just like there's sex, gender, and sexual orientation. And then now there's more gender identity, expression, and kind of learning that they're actually four very different items. So, the pubertal adaptation at the time is that during puberty, sex, because you were assigned male or female, is going to be associated with the organs you have. And based on those organs, you're either going to be internally, meaning inside your body, going to be making testosterone or estrogen. 
because of the organs that you have. In gender identity may be developing, but that identity could have developed when you were three, you're six, eight, whatever the age, and it may coincide as you're physically developing. Sometimes it doesn't always uh, agree, are in agreement with your internal organs, and uh, your identity can be different. The expression is also the development may coincide again with the physical development, or the expression could have developed much younger, and that's kind of deciding how you want to express that identity. And then, of course, sexual orientation, the attraction and behavior can again coincide with your physical development, or relationships and interests could have been developing along the way, not necessarily right when physical puberty is happening. So something that we've adapted um, from Dr. Olson is something called a gender abacus. And one of the things we asked in our clinic is where do you stand, right? And an abacus is used for kind of your age because you guys know about ranges, but in a little kid, they don't understand that things can be a range, right? They're a lot more concrete. But you could be where you're designated at birth, what your expression is, your identity, and your sexual orientation. And you don't necessarily need to be all lined up. You can be here, 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 and then maybe there. So there's a wide range of where you can be. And so there are lots of factors that are happening inside your body if you think from physiology. So the things that help you, know, you grow and develop have to do with your genetics, okay? so. I have genetics that say I'm gonna most likely have darker hair and not be too tall, so my kids are gonna get some of that. That is kind of predetermined, okay? Um, so those are your genes. There are hormones. Hormones, you know, for based on my um, organs, you know, I'm gonna be making estrogen. But there are more than just that one hormone, but at the time of puberty. Nutrition, how well you're eating. If you're underweight, that can be affecting how your puberty is actually going to be developing. Your psyche, when, when um, Dr. Uh, Llewellyn's going to be talking about uh, how you're adjusting, if you have depression, anxiety, other things that are going on, can definitely uh, impact how you're growing. And then metabolism in the sense of not only day-to-day -day metabolism, but overall, are you getting enough um, calories in where that balances? And along with that, over the years, that's how we kind of develop. And the hormones help regulate all of this. So the biggest regulator is your brain. And from your brain, there are messages. And for us who are hormone doctors, we get really excited that they're pulsatile messages. So the messages come and up and down. And once that starts happening from the brain, it goes to what are called your gonads. And gonads is the term that we use medically because it can mean either for your testes or your ovaries, okay? And everybody knows what testes and ovaries are um, because there's lots of other ways to be calling those organs. So if you have testes, then you make testosterone, okay? And if you have ovaries, you make estradiol or estrogen. And those two are going to be responsible for physical body changes that are associated with puberty as well as your growth spurt that happens together. And even though we're all um, more of one hormone or the other, we're still a mix of other hormones. So testosterone in a small amount actually in your body does get converted to estrogen. So even if you have testes and make testosterone, there is some estrogen production that happens because the testosterone gets uh, turned into um, estradiol. And if you're making estrogen um, in your body, you also have little glands called the adrenal glands that are on top of your kidneys and they make um, what are male-like hormones. And they're the ones responsible in uh, people with ovaries for body odor or uh, hair under your armpit, hair down below, pimples, oily hair, okay? So we're still a balance of um, male and female hormones or testosterone and estrogen. And so everybody, like I said, yay, right? Everybody's fair, everyone's gonna get acne. Everyone gets oily skin, body odor, armpit hair, pubic hair, and the growth spurt. Okay, so no matter your identity, you are gonna be getting all of this. And um, how much and which hormone is contributing is what makes it a little bit different. 
So just kind of going over the different stages, uh, if you're a girl with ovary, usually breast development starts around age eight to 10 as a breast bud, and it can be as late as 14 years, and that's still within normal limits. Pubic hair is gonna grow after that, okay? And then periods are about two and a half years later, and it's after the start of breast development. So sometimes parents worry, you know, as soon as that breast bud comes out, we gotta give a talk and we're gonna having periods and you know, carry all the supplies that you're gonna be needing, but you have a little bit of time. And the average age of periods is still about 12 to 12 and a half years. And this might be some of the stuff you've heard about why you have to eat organic and um, you know, girls are getting into puberty so much earlier, some of those things that you might hear, um, and then they promote uh, certain foods or whatnot. So a clarification I wanna make is that if you have a higher weight, you do go into developing your uh, breast bud earlier, but the time from which you actually get your first period has only changed you know, around the world by a couple of months, two, three months, from many, many years ago. So women on average, women with ovaries on average, still have periods about uh, between 12 and 12 and a half years. The other thing to remember also is, particularly in Western culture, it had all been set at the Western cultural kind of time points when people develop. But now when we're looking at Asian cultures, Middle Eastern, African, and you put it all together, well, we all don't have the same timing of development. So that's kind of changing why people think the timing is not exactly at 12 and a half. And then the growth spurt is going to occur, and then you get the start of the periods, so that in total you're gaining about six to eight inches. Okay. So for pubertal development for boys with testes, the testes are the first thing that start enlarging to say that you're in puberty. And that happens around age 10 to 12 years, and it can be as late as 14 years. So a lot of times puberty has started, but a lot of parents may not know that if you have a boy with testes, that your child may be in puberty because you know, you're bathing yourself, you're going to the bathroom by yourself, and it's not something that someone's daily measuring and then says, oh, I started puberty, you know, because my testes have enlarged. So I always say, think about it's just all your other body parts get bigger. So, you know, before it's puberty time, it's a good thing to say, just like that, your testes are also gonna get larger. And we have standards on how much and at what ages they um, get to the sizes they need to be. And then if you look, true pubic hair, doesn't grow for about another one or two years later after the uh, testes have enlarged. So it gives you some time. And then they ma mature around two to three years. So puberty takes time. It takes two to three years. So whether we're doing puberty that's internal or external because we're giving medication to kind of affirm who you are in terms of your gender identity, it's a slower process because it does take two to three years. It doesn't happen overnight. And then the growth spurt here is a little bit different. You're gonna go through puberty and towards the end, the voice drops and then you have your growth spurt. So it's one of the last things that you do in terms of your growth and development. And in total, boys gain about eight to 10 inches. So here's the comparison of the growth patterns. And for that reason, if you looked at those age um, groups that I had said, it's usually the middle school years. And I think for that reason, um, if you notice, girls may have a growth spurt earlier and then boys may have a growth spurt. It just makes it, I always say, an awkward time because everybody's comparing each other and it's like running a race, but everybody has a different kind of standard of where they are. And so it's hard to make those comparisons. Do you teach middle school, you said, or Sometimes, times? Yeah, yeah right, because it, it's really hard to kind of figure that out, where, who's normal and who's not. So usually then they come to a hormone doctor. And the complaints I get, it's, it's too early, that's one complaint, or it's too late, it's too little, something is too much. And then when it doesn't match, then out of our endocrine clinic, we have another uh, specific clinic, we, you can come to our gender clinic to help align that gender identity with the gender assigned at birth so that we can try to help with the alignment physically to kind of match your identity. So with that, 
I'm going to have you listen to me. Listen to Dr. Avila. So I'm with adolescent medicine, and ad ad a lot of people don't know what adolescent medicine is. I didn't know what adolescent medicine is until I did my pediatric residency training. Um, and adolescent medicine, I, I think you can think of two ways. It's, you can think of um, general doctors like pediatricians or family medicine or internists who want to devote their care especially to adolescents. So there are people who just want to see adolescents, believe it or not. Uh, and I'm one of them. <laughs> um, and, um, and we also end up special, during our sub-specialization training, we also um, receive training on specific adolescent issues, um, LGBTQ health being one of them, um, eating disorders, reprodu reproductive health, sexual health, um, and more. Um, and a lot of gynecology health as well. We do a lot of those. Um, so I think we have, when we think of adolescence, so I was watching the um, Incredibles 2 movie um, um, a few weeks ago, and there's one scene where the teenage daughter storms off, she's angry and she storms off, and then her younger brother asks the dad, does she have adolescence? Mm -hmm. um, and I love it. I mean, this is what we think about adolescence. We think about adolescence as a time of turmoil, um, and which is actually not true. But um, when I um, started having uh, philosophy classes in high school, my teacher put these quotes up, and this one she said was from Plato, which is not true. But um, so it says, what's happened to our young people? They disrespect the elders, they disobey their parents, they ignore the law, they ride in the streets inflamed with wild notions, their morals have decaying. Um, this one, she said, was from Hesiod, which again is not true. Um, I see no hope for the future of our people uh, because of our frivolous youth of the day. They're reckless. Uh, when I was young, I used to respect the elders, but now they're not, re they're disrespectful and they're impatient. Um, and this one, she said, was from Egyptian tomb, which again is not true. Um, I ended up doing classics major in undergrad, so I actually can't read in the, I'm like, I know this is not true. We live in a decaying age. Young people no longer respect their parents. They're rude, they're impatient. They go to taverns and have no self-control. So we think, a lot of times we think of adolescence, that's what we think about, is this turmoil. And this is the, these are just uh, some of the thoughts that our society has. But in actuality, that is not true. Most adolescents, the vast majority of adolescents, they do completely well. We just ignore the well part because we don't think it's dramatic, so it's boring. But if you think about it, most of what adolescents actually do, they make good choices. They go to school, um, they do their homework, they're supposed to test their grades. Um, you may have to tell them more than once about their chores, but you know, maybe eventually they'll do them. Um, they, um, but most of what they do is actually good good things, good behaviors, but they don't get credit for it because we, um, it's, a, it's what they do that sometimes get parents annoyed that um, end up giving them a bad reputation sometimes. Um, so sit, these are some of the myths about adolescence. So normal adolescent development is tumultuous, that's not true. That's not to say that there are some turmoils along the way. Those do exist, and, um, but most adolescents do completely fine. Um, adolescence is a time of increased emotionality. Blame those hormones. Um, not true. They actually did studies about this. Um, 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 it's, it's, it's just a little difference in adolescence compared to um, prepubescent children because um, they're more independent, they're more vocal. It's a different type of development. Uh, but they're just as emotional as adults. Uh, they may exaggerate the emotions a little bit more, but uh, that's because they don't have a prefrontal cortex of the brain still developed. So it's not their fault, it's the brain. Um, puberty's negative event. It's not. I think a lot of people are embarrassed about puberty and pubertal changes. Um, I certainly hated puberty, uh, but it's, it's not a negative event. It doesn't necessarily cause post-traumatic stress disorder or any, or, 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 or it, it, it's, it's just part of a change and that I think as a society, sometimes we get, um, we attribute uh, embarrassment to, but uh, if we normalize it, things are, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty good event, it's just part of development. Is it, a, is it a time of increased risk for suicide? And I think that gets, um, 
um, thought a lot uh, that teenagers and, and it's associated with suicide and shows like 13 Reasons Why, for instance, where we talk about suicide. As a matter of fact, the suicide rates for adults are much higher, it's probably a double of adolescents, but we don't talk about that. So why do we talk about suicide in adolescents? Because for the most part, they're healthy. Like the actual number one cause of um, mortality in teens is um, accidental injuries. It has nothing to do with suicide. Um, but we get that myth that um, teens are increased use for suicide. Now, LGBTQ kids um, do have um, higher risk for suicide compared to the um, um, peers, uh, but that often has to do with the intolerance of the environment they are in. Has no, there's nothing about being LGBTQ that puts you at risk for um, um, higher risk for suicide. It has to do with your environment and the acceptance around you and that in, um, um, what, is, what, what is the environment at your home, what is the environment in your school um, that is constantly, constantly bombarding you with um, either love or aggressions or microaggressions. Um, and Dr. Luwala may discuss this further or not, I don't know. Um, and I think this is so untrue that I'm not even going, I'm gonna bypass it. Um, so when we ask about what is adolescence, and, and, and um, I think that's a hard, uh, it's, a, um, it's hard to give a definition of what that means. Um, and there are some cultural changes. Uh, some people even think, well, adolescence didn't exist until the modern era, which again, is not completely true. But um, so it's, it's easier to talk about stages. And, 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 and um, so what is, um, what is an adolescent supposed to achieve from a physical standpoint, from a social emotional standpoint, from a cognitive and moral standpoint? And when we talk about LGBTQ kids, we we're just talking about, or teens, we we're talking about regular adolescent development. Um, there are some <coughs> things that we, we may have to focus more, um, but it's, it's nothing to do with being an LGBTQ um, teen. It's more about behaviors if they exist. So from a physical standpoint, Dr. I already talked about growth spurt in puberty. One thing I, want, I just want to mention is because nobody talks about it, is uh, menstrual periods. Um, so, uh, and a lot of people don't, because they don't want to talk about it, we forget what normal is. And sometimes a teenager who doesn't have a normal period um, thinks it's normal because that's how it's always been or because that's how mom's is or the, the, the family. Uh, pattern has been and um, so some of those challenges that may occur around periods they go past by because they think it's normal that's how it is that, and so I invite um, teens to have this discussion um, and when they talk to come to the doctor's office and because we can do things about these things um, there is treatment around it um, it's one of those it's one of those teenager issues that often gets ignored because nobody asks and nobody wants to talk about. Um, and I, that's what's I think most important from a medical standpoint in teenagers. Um, it's making sure they have a good doctor-patient relationship, sorry, a good relationship with their doctors. Um, and sometimes that means uh, seeing an adolescent medicine specialist, but not always. Uh, most pediatricians, um, they follow their patients for a long, long time, and a lot of times the teenagers have a very good relationship with the pediatrician, and as long as it's, 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 it's an office where they feel welcome and they feel the, 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 um, their issues are being heard, um, it's perfectly fine not to see an adolescent medicine physician, but we make sure in adolescent medicine, in adolescent medicine we follow people until age 26, um, and we make sure that we have a welcoming environment for all teens of all stripes and colors. Um, we do a lot of gynecology and sometimes seeing a guy, we have parents saying, does my kid need to see a gynecologist? Um, or I need to bring my kid to a gynecologist. And I say, why? I'm like, well, they, because when they have the periods, that's what my parents did to me. And I'm like, well, I have great news for you. You do not have to see a gynecologist. Um, um, we don't even have to do that kind of exam that um, gynecologists do with the speculum until they're about age 21. So teenagers don't have to see gynecology. 
adolescent medicine, a lot of pediatricians are comfortable managing some gynecological problems. Adolescent medicine, for sure. The only time I refer patients to a gynecology is when um, there's, I think there's some surgical thing that needs to be done because I'm not surgically trained. So if I think there needs to be some surgical intervention, I refer to um, gynecology. Um, and more than, I think this doctor relationship, seeing the pediatrician or seeing uh, whoever it is, it's more than just doing a sports physical or your annual physical or your routine physical. Um, this is the time that we are assessing not only physical development, development in the other areas as well. Um, so that's when we typically kick the parents out um, and we have time to talk to the teenager about um, issues in a more in, in a confidential setting. Uh, the, in the safe setting too, because a lot of times the teenagers may want to talk about things, they may want to ask questions, but not in front of the parents. So um, there's that, always this opportunity where we, we, ask the, we invite the parents to step out so we can um, talk about the other stuff and give the teenagers the space and this time uh, to discuss other issues that they may not want to talk in front of their parents. Um, I think immunizations, I'll skip the immunizations part, but immuniza there is a, these are teenager immunizations that are also important. Um, most of the time the teenagers I see are older teenagers, so they already have their HPV series, vaccine series, and the Tdap, and, um, uh, and we end up doing more the, the meningitis series. Um, I, I think teenagers get such a bad rap, which is so sad. Um, that, but there's this other myth that teenagers make bad choices. S that's not really true, and um, um, we all make bad choices and good choices. That's just how life is. But um, but I think some of the some of the choices that we think are bad that teenagers make usually has to do with this fact that the prefrontal cortex of the brain, the four part of the brain is not well developed yet. And this is the part of the brain that's responsible for the complexity, that, uh, complexity around making decisions. So making judgment uh, about um, the pros and cons, foreseeing the consequences of those decisions, and also um, weighing in um, emotions and, and controlling your, your emotions and impulses. That's not, that doesn't finish developing until in your uh, early 20s. A lot of, uh, and so that's just responsible for some of this future thinking to this thinking of head. A lot of bad choices that we think teenagers make, uh, most of them have to do with reward and peer pressure. So reward is a different part of the brain, it's in the limbic system of your brain, and it just has to be immediate. Um, so, um, I don't know, staying late at a party when they're not supposed to go to a party, you know, that's their immediate reward. But it can also be peer pressure. Um, and it's very important, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, for families to talk about um, with their teens, what do you do in the scenarios in where you're going to be exposed to something that could potentially lead you to make a bad choice, right? Because those are gonna happen in high school uh, you're going to be exposed to um, um, tobacco smoking or weed, um, alcohol. You're going to be um, exposed to um, maybe some bad situations um, and what to do about it. This is how this is a lot of people see teens, right? The judgment gland, which is not a gland, but the judgment gland, right? The small little thing up here. There's a lot of room for love. Um, this is the, and there's this love-hate relationship with the parents. Um, this is where the prefrontal cortex would be, would be a room over here. So even though I don't, I don't like the gland because it's not a gland, um, um, the fact that the judgment's small, I can blame that in the prefrontal cortex of the brain's not developed. So next time you do something that your parents don't like, just blame on your brain that's still developing. I'm gonna skip a little bit of this part. This is part of the, the milestones from social emotional um, development during adolescence. And I'm just gonna skip this first three and go straight 
to the exploration of romantic relationships and sense of one's sexuality and gender, and, and sometimes gender identity. Um, a lot of times gender identity. Um, so this, this, I think we can blame, uh, maybe we can blame the hormones for this one. I don't like blaming hormones in general. Uh, but uh, with the surge of your hormones, um, you also start having some sexual attraction, increasing libido, and, 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 and this is the time where you're more aware of yourself and, and have a body image, and you're starting exploring your um, um, sexuality and, um, and also romantic feelings. And those are, all these three are very different, right? Who you're attracted to romantically, who you're attracted to sexually, how you identify yourself uh, gender-wise, are completely different things. Um, for a lot of people, I am, um, they, they align themselves with um, what we'd call red or normativity and cis-normativity, um, and uh, maybe their sexual attraction with the romantic attraction. So, um, so my father would say, for instance, I think, I don't know, I never asked him, but, um, you know, that he would be a heterosexual man and like he's attracted to women. So in this case, heterosexual, but he also has romantic feeling for women. So he is heteroromantic. Um, um, and he would be identifying as the assigned sex at birth, so the, uh, the male sex that was assigned to him. So he'd be a cisgender. But it can be a crisscross match of anything because all of these three things, like most things in science, are, there's a reference, there's a spectrum. Um, even when you do lab, lab work, um, there's a spectrum of numbers that we consider normal and um, um, everything is in the spectrum or outside the spectrum, within the spectrum. It's, it's, so it gets a little bit more um, complicated and fun and we learn a lot about it from our teenagers too. So um, from a um, sexual attraction standpoint, so you can be asexual and not have any sexual feelings towards um, any gender. Um, that can be um, a little bit more fluid and the, the names that people have for it vary. It can be demisexual. Um, for instance, um, I haven't heard sexual flux yet, but um, that could happen. Um, and you can be asexual, but still have romantic feelings and romantic needs and want to be in a romantic relationship. Um, there was a couple in England who recently married and um, they uh, identified themselves as asexual, but they, um, but they're in a romantic relationship and to anybody's eyes, nobody would ever find out they're asexual because they still have those same longings uh, to be with someone, the same caressing, the same um, emotional needs and um, emotional impulse to give love um, in a romantic relationship setting. And from a romantic relationship, you can be heteromantic you're rom you're, uh, or homoromantic, attracted to um, people of the same gender identity or not of the same uh, gender identity. Or maybe you can be aromantic, like I don't have feelings, romantic feelings towards any, um, anyone in particular or gender. I don't, I don't have this need of being in a romantic relationship uh, or have romantic attraction to anything. Um, aeroflux, I I've, uh, I've have uh, two patients who identify as aerofluxes, meaning they are, they don't have romantic feelings for the most part, but sometimes maybe. Um, I think that's a, a simple way, simplistic way of, of definition. So it's a little more fluid. Most of the time I don't have romantic feelings, but you know, I, mean, I can see myself some of that and sometimes maybe. Um, and then from a, um, a sexual standpoint, other um, sexual orientation, so just leaving the romantic side a little bit. Uh, just like you can be asexual, you can be pansexual, attracted to all genders of any kind in the whole, the whole rainbow. Um, can be sap sapiosexual, I'm attracted not to a specific gender, but I'm attracted to someone's intellect, someone's intelligence. Um, and it's not much their gender, it's, 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 it's their mind. Um, I'm not going with polyamorous because I think that's more a behavioral thing. But, um, but the point here is that romantic attraction and sexual attraction are different. So is gender identity. And they're both, it's a huge spectrum. Um, it's, it's, it's not just a binary 
uh, one or the other, but anything can be, can be um, anything in the spectrum is, is, is valid. And sometimes this can, um, this can change too. It's a journey. You may not have landed there. So I have um, somebody who, and this, like, even a sexual attraction, like we have people who may say, um, you know, heterosexual, and then later on, they identify as bisexual and um, or homosexual. Um, so this, the same with this. Maybe I'm asexual now, and maybe this is where I landed, but maybe not. Maybe down the road, um, I start developing some sexual attraction towards someone. Um, Whatever you fall within the spectrum, one of my focuses is on healthy dating and relationship. And I think this is where in the past we have gone wrong teaching sex ed classes because we focus so much on STDs and STD prevention and we forgot to talk about this, which is so important. Um, and um, because this is the part this is one of the uh, emotional, social um, milestones that we expect adolescents to achieve uh, when they transition to young adult is being able to have um, close relationships, whether that's friendships or romantic relationships. Um, and so when I ask patients, when I ask them if they're dating someone, are they in a relationship, or they've been in a relationship, my next follow-up question is, um, and how? Do you think it's healthy? And then they give you this blank stare. I'm like, well, what do you mean you think it's healthy? I uh, just want to, um, um, and uh, so we talk about respect. We're talking about uh, respecting your uh, relationship partner. And we talk about consent and asking for permission. And even silly things as I think before you hold hands, like you should ask for permission. Like, can I hold your hand? So little things like, well, this is more our, our middle school, but. Um, but the point is, and, and I'll ask about, um, do they feel safe in their relationship? Has they ever felt they were coerced to do something they didn't want to do? Um, um, and we delve a little bit more to make sure that you're healthy. So it's great you're dating, and it's great you're having a relationship, but also I think we need to emphasize, are they, is it healthy? Are, it's, are they safe? Um, is consent and respect, is my no being heard as no? Um, well, we'll skip this part. Um, whatever your romantic identity, sexual identity, gender identity is, um, we can't make assumptions, like in, in the medical field, we can't make assumptions based on that. So I cannot say, for instance, that um, gay men are at a higher risk for HIV acquisition. That statement I cannot make because I am pretty much saying that the sexual identity is at a risk for this, which is not true. It's not the identity, it's the behavior. So um, when we, for instance, we have the um, Center for Disease Controls that um, help us come up with guidelines on how to test people for STDs, and it's all based on behavior. It's not based on gender identity. Is um, So they are, um, so people who are having um, sex with people of the other gender, and it depends on who they are, there is this panel of labs that's recommended versus people. It's nothing to do with your sexuality, it has to do with the behavior. Um, and because of these assumptions are made, we have a lot of health disparities in sexual health sometimes because of this. So for instance, um, the rate of teen pregnancy in lesbians is higher than in um, those who identify as heterosexual cisgender women. Why is it higher? They, because in the medical office, they, when they tell us I identify as lesbian, we make, sadly, we make assumptions that, oh, they're, they're only having, if they're having a sexual relationship, there's only somebody of the same um, uh, um, gender identity. Um, and then, but that's not always the case. So somebody can identify as a heterosexual uh, man, for instance, but still have sexual relations with a man. I will never find out if I don't ask about behaviors. So a lot of the health disparities that exist in LGBTQ health has to do with the assumptions uh, people make in, uh, based on their romantic sexual or gender identity instead of focusing on behavior.
And so we've tried to change that in the recent years in our practice. Um, for our teenagers, um, A lot of parents, it's so hard for them to think that their teenagers could be having sex. And that is very hard, because it's my baby. This cannot be happening. Um, the fact, though, is that by the time, the, the time they finish high school, the statistics of 70% of them will have some sort of sexual experience, whatever that is. So if I'm seeing high school students in my office, the probability of one of them being exposed or being in some sort of um, uh, sexual experience is about 50%, it's like flipping a coin. Um, um, we have, when we look at, in at, at, when we talk about abstinence, and I think abstinate, abstinence is the best way of preventing STIs and preventing teen pregnancy. It is the best. Like if you're not going to do it, how are you going to be exposed to those things? However, we, uh, abstinence only programs High schools with absence-only programs have higher teen pregnancy rates than schools that talk about everything else. Um, so that's the fact because people don't want to think about it, so they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and, they, and because they don't talk about it, our teens, and teenagers don't like talking about it with the parents either, so they don't get taught about it and there's no communication, so we can't talk about prevention. So what we emphasize a lot is prevention. And obviously we'd love if that talk starts at home, um, um, but because we know that sometimes it's like an awkward talk, we make sure that it happens in schools, it happens in the doctor's office, and we talk a lot about how to prevent before it happens. Uh, so we talk about STI protection, contraception, um, for uh, individuals who are exposed to um, or have higher risk for HIV acquisition because of their behavior, we talk about PrEP or Truvada, which is a medication, that's the medication. It's a medication for, to prevent HIV transmission. It reduces by more than 90% um, the transmission rate. Uh, we talk about HPV vaccination. HPV is the most common organism that gets spread sexually. Um, by the age of 50, 80% of, of adults by age 50 will have been exposed to it. And so it can cause a lot of genital and oral cancers. And it's the only vaccine we have to prevent those cancers. And it can also cause genital warts. So it's the only vaccine we, uh, uh, that can prevent that. Um, so we make sure to talk about that and as I mentioned before, pap smear, we don't do them anymore until they're 21, unless there's a specific reason why we should do it. Uh, so we don't do that kind of exam, the sensitive exam, unless um, there is a need to. Um, this is also the time high school that is, where um, the, um, most teens are exposed to someone who, or a friend, or somebody, or they get offered about weed and tobacco products, vaping, and e-cigs count, um, or alcohol. The LGBTQ population have a higher rate of use of these products. It's nothing to do with being LGBTQ. Um, it has more to do with trying to cope uh, with the microaggressions that they receive um, living in a very heterosis normative world. And sometimes bullying is very common, sadly, in schools. Um, and uh, for instance, in our trans kids, about 15% of them drop high school because of bullying, uh, because of their gender identity. So it's not uncommon that instead of um, going to therapy, for instance, they may try to treat that um, with um, weed or tobacco, alcohol. And it's very hard to talk to teens of, again, the prefrontal cortex, the brain is now well formed, so it's very hard to tell me, don't, sm don't smoke, you're going to get lung cancer. Because teens think they're invis invincible. That's, it's hard to think of the future. It's the right now. Right now I live and I'm invincible. So we talk about, okay, so you don't want to do it now because uh, impaired judgment. Your brain, most of all, your brain's still developing. And we do know that marijuana um, 
and alcohol is, uh, as well affect the developing brain. And they do show pictures sometimes of the brain images from those who are exposed to weed or not. Because teenagers, most of the time, they value the brain. Most of the time. Uh, we talk about also, you know, if you're going to do it, um, wh how, if you're going to do it, what are you going to do about safety? Because this is a time where your judgment may be impaired. This is a time where uh, some people can take advantage of you, or you can pose risk to others by being impaired. We talk about legal consequences. So you may lose your scholarship, or you may uh, get in trouble with the police, and that is, won't go look good in the college. Um, from a medical school, I remember they told us that if any of us got a, D, a DUI, we would be kicked out. Um, and in our loans, we had loans to pay. And so I remember, so I'm like, oh, I am never driving to any party. That's what I decided to do after I heard that. So there, that's how we talk usually about teens and, and try to help them with the pros and cons and, and, come and help them come to their realization that making these choices, it's probably not the best decision for them right now. Um, and we focus on that now. And we lo I love talking to the, the parents and the teens too. And I urge them, okay, you may go to a party where people may be smoking weed. How you're going to... How are you going to plan around that? So sometimes I have uh, the, 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 the teen and the, and the parent come up with maybe code words or some code something where, I don't know, because a lot of times the teens don't want to do it, but they feel the peer pressure. Again, that's the, 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 we talk about the peer pressure being one of the drivers for bad behaviors. Um, so I call, uh, you know, they, oh, you know, Actually, I need to call. I forgot that my mom told me to call her at this time. So let me do it before I get in trouble. And then like, oh, mom, yes, I forgot. Yes, I have to come home. OK, are you going to send an Uber? Something along those lines, some plan. So plan before it happens, because at the time, the peer pressure is so big that you won't know how to cope around it or go around it. Um, so it's much easier to have a plan. Was there a cold word or? Um, I had one teen who said, um, I think they were partying and they were drinking, and they said, oh, come on, drink, and they're forcing him to drink. And then he said, I don't drink because my um, uncle died from being an alcoholic. I'm like, wow, that's very powerful. It worked. Um, but I think the point is having a plan with your teen and discussing, okay, when this, if, you're gonna, if this happens, how are you going to deal with it so that you don't fall into the peer pressure? Um, LGBTQ community, the health teens, are you're very, very pressured into um, um, body image and looking a certain way, uh, more than their um, non-LGBTQ peers. Um, body image is already so, so heavy in, in adolescence. I think as we all have been self-conscious, like acne and whatnot, or I'm not as tall as so-and-so. Um, but a lot of times they feel this pressure that the body has to be one certain way and they may engage in behaviors that may not be healthy. Um, and uh, for instance, like if, if, if somebody with uterus is very, very supportive in sports and stop losing periods, that's not healthy. That's one of those red flags. Trying to manipulate their weight to do a certain way, you're weighing every day, that's, so those are the red flags that we think about. Eating disorder is uh, one of the most common chronic conditions in adolescence. So these kind of things, because teens are already vulnerable to engage in these behaviors, we just make sure it doesn't spiral out of control and, and, and go into an eating disorder. So a lot of times we talk, I screen up with our teenagers about that, especially the LGBTQ population. I think... From a parenting standpoint, there, sadly, there's no, as you know, there's no instructions manual. The kids don't come with instruction manuals. Um, but in, in, in order to help them um, go through a successful adolescence, having communication is key, especially that's when it's open and non-judgmental. Preparing, it's the anticipatory guide. It's like a vaccine. We do it before they get exposed to it. Um, uh, so preparing them for those scenarios where they may feel peer pressured. Um, accepting and support. Love is, goes heavily. So even if they don't understand the team, they don't agree with their team, but accepting goes long, long ways because at the end of the day, all that they want is to be loved and know that the parents are gonna love them unconditionally. So this is heavy. Um, advocating for your teens at the doctor's office, at school, and fostering independence so they can also take care of themselves and be able to 
um, um, cope with the challenges in adult life, which is the next phase of their life. Thank you. All right. I'm Andy Tipoinka Llewellyn. I'm the clinical psychologist with our child and adolescent psychiatry department, and I'm the psychologist with our gender clinic. Um, I'm going to try my best not to be too repetitive because I think Dr. Avila could put me out of a job in terms of his knowledge of psychosocial development and adolescence. And so some of it might be a little bit of what he said, but I hope to focus more in terms of what families can do to better support their teens. So just to echo a little bit of what everybody said, um, I like this because my, my house smells like glitter and raging hormones. And that's kind of the, the sense that, you know, this is what society is kind of communicating to us about teenagers, this blame it on the hormones kind of perspective of, um, you know, the house can be in turmoil because of adolescence. And this has a lot to do with these raging hormones and what this is doing to our kids. Um, but actually, you know, what Dr. Avalo is saying is very true in that uh, kids make pretty good choices given what they're up against. So adolescents are up against a lot. This is a really, really demanding time. So it's not necessarily, um, I like to reframe things in terms of thinking about where the risk has really come from, coming from. It's not necessarily that adolescence in itself because of where kids are in their brain development, although of course, yes, with, with impulsivity and the development of the prefrontal cortex, these are all important things to take into account. But teenagers just have so many more demands than adults do in terms of their identity development, in terms of what this means for themselves and how they see themselves, where they see themselves in the world, um, where they see themselves within peer groups. And we're asking them to do this at a really vulnerable time when they're going to a place that, it's kind of ridiculous when you think about it, they're going to a place every single day where all of the other kids are trying to figure this out too. And then they're all trying to figure out how to be together in this way. Who am I? Who are you? How do we fit together? Um, it's just, it's, it's a lot of demands. And then on top of that, we're telling them, um, oh, and you need to go to college, so make sure that you're studying really, really hard. And it's not going to be like elementary school anymore. You're going to have like seven or eight classes now with seven or eight different teachers. And so the demands that we're placing on them in all of these different aspects are so high that it's no wonder that there is a higher risk for uh, the beginning of that development of depression and anxiety to start to hit kids around this time of development. So if you are going through this trajectory and you are a part of the majority group. So let's say that the trajectory of your development and what your identity is and, and how people anticipate that you will identify, who you will love, what your life will look like, what that story of your development will look like. Let's say that you're in the majority group. You're still faced with all of these demands, right? So thinking about somebody who was born, Dr. Hands the baby to parents, says it's a girl, child develops and says, yes, I am a girl. I like to wear pink. I like to wear dresses. I like to do all of the things that girls, you know, are, are, are thought to do in this society. And I also am attracted to boys. I want to have a romantic relationship with a boy. I want to marry a boy. I want to have two and a half kids, um, move to the suburbs and et cetera, et cetera. Though we're still asking that teenager to go through a lot of demands in terms of their identity development, because they're still trying to figure out well, what, what kind of a girl do I want to be? What does this mean for my future? What do I want to do with my life? Who are my friends? What do, what do they want? My friends think differently than me about this. What do I think about that? It's a lot of demands. And this is all within a majority normative group in terms of heteronormative and cisnormative. Um, what does it mean then when you're going through all of those same demands and you belong somewhere in this spectrum of identities? It used to be that we used to say, okay, well, um, maybe somebody might grow up and um, then they'll just kind of have to figure out if they're gay or if they're straight. So there's that demand that's added to, to that developmental trajectory. Then we started to understand, well, it's not just gay or straight, you know, as we kind of showed in that abacus before, it's a whole spectrum. And it's not just about gay or straight or on the spectrum of sexuality in terms of the whole range of attractions that you can have, but it's also completely separate from who you are in terms of your gender. And actually it's not just that somebody can be transgender, but they can also be gender fluid and they can have a whole slew of identities on a spectrum of gender as well. And so if you, you know, happen to attend any of the Pride events this year, I, I felt like this was the first year where it really kind of looked like the United Nations in terms of the banners of different organizations. There was just so many new flags 
And I, you know, was looking at them and just so intrigued with how people who have been members of the LGBT community for, you know, decades and decades were looking at these flags and trying to find themselves in new ways that they hadn't really explored before and, and saw flags that corresponded with their identity in ways that they hadn't really thought about before because we're thinking about identity with so much more fluidity. And that's a big relief for a lot of teenagers that before haven't really been able to fit in a binary of what we were you know, trying to, to kind of box them into. But it can also be pretty overwhelming because now it's kind of like, you know, everything is fair game in terms of who are you? It's a relief because, okay, so there's no limit to who I can be. Now I can actually just let my true and authentic identi identity rise to the surface. But in order for that to be the case, we really need to provide the space for that identity to rise to the surface. And if it does, so we can see, you know, let's say this is about me, so gender identity. Now, if we know who we are, we're trying to figure that out in adolescence at the same time as trying to figure out where our attractions are. And as we were saying, where our romantic attractions are, which is separate from where our sexual attractions are. And then we get a whole mess of what are the possibilities? Possibilities are infinite. Right. Again, a huge relief if you're no longer trying to get into this box of who you are, but also a little bit overwhelming. I think it's been overwhelming for providers even and teachers and you know, educators, parents, everybody, because now we're kind of like, okay, where do we start now? Um, before we used to just talk about gay or straight or trans or cis, but now how do we even educate our kids when there's so many different combinations, so many different identities, so many ways that those identities work together? How do we support our kids as they're also having to navigate the other demands uh, in terms of just adolescent development in general, in terms of who I am and how that's going to fit into this world? Now, um, what we are really struggling with in terms of, of that piece is also the fact that with this whole combination, right, these kids are navigating a world that is not necessarily equipped right now to educate them and to support them in terms of understanding um, what their safe practices should be, um, how to pursue emotional health in other relationships because the relationships are new to us who, who are trying to understand the, the diversity in this group. So they're navigating this heteronormative, cisnormative world that's kind of set up for them where we are stuck kind of still teaching the simple basics of uh, boys have a penis and girls have a vagina and we're not considering what's getting left out of that information that we're presenting. And so Dr. Avalo is making a great point in terms of teaching within identities and not teaching within behaviors because think about the people that we're leaving out when we have this example of a lesbian trans woman and a pansexual cis woman. This is a couple that are two women who can reproduce and they may not receive the education that they need to receive in order to know how to keep themselves um, safe within a relationship in a multitude of ways, how to have safe practices, how to, um, how to have uh, family planning that's appropriate with what their goals are. We're leaving them out of the discussion because the focus has been so much on this kind of heteronormative, cisnormative way of teaching information. And so what I'm encountering is a lot of families that are very overwhelmed in wanting to advocate for their kids, but also and inform themselves about how to educate their kids, um, but finding themselves kind of at a loss because they don't have the information that they need for the specific identity and the specific um, relationships that their kids are pursuing. And that's where, yes, talking about behaviors is so important and something that I also think is incredibly important is talking about values. Whenever we're feeling overwhelmed in terms of how to support our kids and we're getting caught up in all of these changing, uh, the changing language and the changing understanding and dynamics of these relationships, we need to take a breath, take a moment, and stop focusing on what we don't know and kind of go down to the basics of what we do know in terms of our values. What is it that regardless of identity, if we're putting identity aside, if we're putting um, gender identity and sexuality aside, what do we want our kids to know about their relationships, about how um, they should be treated, how they should treat others, how they should um, pursue a relationship that's in their best emotional and social interest? What are the values that we are teaching them? So 
I would ask you guys to also think about what are your family values? What are the values that you were taught? And I also want to make the distinction between values and beliefs because oftentimes those two get convoluted and we um, start thinking back to the beliefs that we were taught in terms of what's okay and what's not okay. And I'm talking about something that's a little bit deeper than that, which is values, which is how you feel about yourself, um, how you feel about others, how you, what you think is important in terms of how we treat each other, how we treat ourselves, what kinds of values would you want to instill in your child? When you think about the way that your child views themselves, when you think about the way that your child feels they should be treated, when you think about the way that your child, um, how your child feels about the contributions that they would have to the world, and that they would have to relationships. What are those values that you would like to instill in your child? What are the hopes that you are expecting those values to carry out for your child in the future in their development? These are all incredibly important because something that I find too often is that parents start to feel as though the values that they have and the hopes that they have for their child don't really fit with what they understand about that child's identity. They seem to kind of bump up against each other. And what happens then is the value feels very fixed. You know, I, I want my child to have a happy and healthy life. That seems like a great value, right? But then we see the statistics about LGBTQ identities and we say, hey, that, that doesn't fit because the statistics are pretty scary in telling us that LG people that are in the LGBT community are at higher risk for depression, anxiety, higher risk for substance use, school dropout, um, leading to lower rates of employ employment, poor health outcomes, risk of victimization. These are all these risk factors that we read about that are, you know, quote unquote, associated with LGBTQ identities. And we say that doesn't fit with this value that I have of wanting my kid to grow up and be happy and healthy and a productive person. So where is that, that mismatch? And I think, you know, echoing what you said in terms of, is this really about the LGBTQ identity? No, we are understanding from the research that this is not about identities in and of themselves, but it's about the stress that gets added on top of being a part of this minority group. So having to navigate all of those stressful things that come with just development in life, but then having to do that on top of that being a part of a minority group that is constantly exposed to negative feedback. And this is something termed minority stress model. It works um, across, or it's, I shouldn't say it works, but you know, unfortunately in a negative way, it, ha it, it uh, happens to uh, all minority groups and that they are consistently exposed to stressors that the majority groups don't have to experience. Um, if we wanted to understand how minority stress works, we can look at it at three different levels, which would be at the very top, this idea that Yes, higher rates of victimization are, is a reality in society. So people who have an LGBTQ identity and are expressing that identity are at higher risk for being objectively victimized in that they might be bullied, uh, they might hear, um, they, they might um, hear slurs from people at school, they might be the victims of physical aggression, they might be um, thrown out of the home, things like that that are placing them at higher risk. Then, because we have knowledge of that risk, there's a layer under that, which is the expectation of what if that happens and the stress that that causes. So for adolescents, even before coming out to parents thinking and having this kind of narrative of what happens to LGBTQ people, having this narrative builds up that expectation of, well, if I come out, what if, what if, what if, what if? What if I go to school and I'm going to get bullied? What if I come out to my parents and they feel uh, embarrassed that I'm, that I'm LGBTQ? What if I come out to my parents and they kick me out of the house? What if I get kicked out of my church? What if all of those expectations of that outward discrimination also build up and add stress that, that increases that risk for anxiety and increases that risk for depression. And then there's an underlying um, piece of that minority stress, which is what you do with that understanding that the world might have this kind of reaction to you. And that's what you think about yourself and how you start to devalue yourself if you think about that. So it's not necessarily or and at all really about the LGBTQ identity, but it's this kind of three-tiered effect of what it is to be a minority and to have these expectations of how others will see you and to let those expectations then influence how you see yourself. So, uh, well, I should have 
come to the slide a little bit sooner, but this I think is the scariest risk for uh, families and for providers, for, for everybody who's working with LGBTQ people is um, this elevated risk for suicide as Dr. Avila had reviewed. Um, so that uh, nearly four times, um, LGBT youth are nearly four times more likely and questioning youth are three times more likely to attempt suicide than their straight peer. And I think the scariest one is that 50% of transgender youth have seriously thought about taking their lives and about a fourth have um, reportedly made a serious attempt. So um, again, this is not to do with the actual identity, but with what it means to walk through life every day with that three-tiered effect that we talked about of minority stress. So um, one of the expectations that I think is so important for kids in terms of what it's going to be like when they come out or what the experience is after they come out is what that minority stress feels like within the home. So something that really distinguishes LGBTQ individuals from other minority groups is that for the most part, other minority groups tend to be able to find uh, community within their family in terms of that shared identity of, you know, within that minority group. Um, so African American kids tend to, of course not always, but tend to come from African American families um, and uh, um, people from religious minority groups tend to also be associated with a religious community that also shares that identity. Whereas kids that are LGBTQ, they pop up all over the place, right? There's um, all uh, there's LGBTQ kids across all ethnicities, all races, all religious groups. Um, it's not something that is necessarily linked with the family that kids are born into. And so not only do they become a minority in terms of the community, in terms of society, but they're also a minority within their family. And that minority stress goes one layer deeper in that it's being affected in terms of how they feel within their family. So this is from the Human Rights Campaign Youth Report from 2018. Um, that said 48% of LGBTQ youth out to their parents say their families make them feel bad for being LGBTQ. 67% um, hear their families make negative comments about LGBTQ people. Only 25% um, have families that show support by getting involved in, a large, as in the larger LGBTQ and ally community. 24% definitively can't be, uh, or only 24% can definitively be themselves as LGBTQ person in the home. And 78% not out to their parents as LGBTQ hear their families make negative comments about LGBTQ people. So regardless of what that LGBTQ identity is, let's think about what this, the, the kids that are part of these statistics, what they're learning in terms of their values, in terms of the values that the parents might want to communicate to those kids about who they are, how they feel about themselves, how they can contribute to uh, relationships, how they should be treated in relationships, how they can be productive individuals of society. What are the values that they are really hearing about themselves as human beings? Thinking about that lower tier of how stress from expecting discrimination, or sorry, stress from actual discrimination, stress from expecting discrimination, and then stress from what all of that does to how you feel about yourself. What are the values that these kids are learning? Are they learning that they're valuable human beings, that their identities are valid, and um, that they should be valued in other relationships? from this. It's not something that's really sticking out in terms of what they are probably learning about themselves. Um, I, you know, I, I think we share these statistics a lot when we talk about, when we kind of talk about the narrative of common LGBTQ experiences. Um, it's very tragic, but at the same time, I take a lot of hope from this. And when I talk to families that are personally struggling with this, I take a lot of hope with the fact that there is so much work that can be done to change this narrative of how um, these identities are being discussed in the home. Because, so the um, San Francisco State University did um, some studies and has put together a packet on family acceptance to show that by changing the way that families interact with their kids, by changing the way that families treat their child's identity, it, they can actually provide such a protective factor that buffers these risks that we're talking about. So creating a safe space at home, and you can see it's pretty linear here in terms of this graphic, the higher the rejection. So again, I, I like to switch the way that these are phrased, but I'm going to start off by just reading them off the way they are here. But the, the higher the rejection is in the home, the higher the risk of a lifetime suicide attempt. 
the lower the rejection is in the home, the lower the risk of a lifetime suicide attempt. And that's just not just for suicidality, but it's also for drug use and also for risk of HIV infection. So I like to switch these around because this isn't just about being less rejecting, but it, or, or just about um, you know telling families, look what you're doing to your kids. It's actually, I think, pretty empowering to think about what power parents have to be able to protect their kids from these risk factors that we hear so often about, that we read so often about. It is within a parent's power to protect the child from the very fears that are bumping up against each other in terms of that value. I want my child to be a happy, healthy person that has confidence and self-respect and that doesn't seem to fit with an LGBT identity. There's actually a way that it can fit and that's by accepting the identity. So <clears throat> here's some parent and family facts that was also, um, it says family acceptance here, but it's also, this was also provided by the Human Rights Campaign in the 2018 Youth Report. In order to show, so every, everybody who's here today, I think, you know, you can think about what does just being here today with your child, what kind of message does that send in terms of values um, for your child's identity to your child right now that you have said, okay, so something came up with regards to identity and I care enough about that that I want to learn more about you, that I want to learn more how to support you and be here for you. What kind of message does that communicate to your child and how might they then internalize that message in terms of how they feel about themselves? Um, I think that's a really, really positive message. Um, so finding other ways to communicate that message would be critical in terms of buffering the risk factors associated with minority stress for LGBTQ youth. So other ways that you can do that are learning more facts and staying informed about um, issues that impact LGBT youth. Learning about um, how, uh, how different districts in terms of school districts, inclusion policies that impact youth, how those might be affecting your child or peers of your child or how they might be affecting your child, even if they're happening across the country in a different state, how that might be affecting your child in terms of understanding how the country is viewing them and how that might be creating some fears and affecting some of the values in terms of how they see themselves advocating for them with regards of LGBTQ inclusive curriculum and programming clubs. Um, I would say also, um, I kind of, I kind of want to mix these two together, advocating for, for in terms of curriculum, so going to schools and advocating, going to clubs and advocating for inclu inclusion, um, but also making your home safe and affirming for LGBTQ youth, whether or not you have openly LGBTQ youth. I like to put those together because I also think something that's very challenging for families, um, where families could really benefit from more support is advocating for their kids even within their home, even outside of their immediate family, because that can sometimes be pretty challenging. Um, so advocating for them with extended family, uh, advocating for them when you hear comments that are made that you might um, be able to pick up on how that might affect the way that your child views themselves and the values that they're developing about themselves. That can be pretty tough because it's a delicate topic in terms of a combination of personal beliefs and personal values. Um, but think about the message that it does send to your child if you are able to advocate for them even in that difficult of a situation to say, um, I'm going to stand up for you and I'm going to make it clear to our family that this is what it means to be respectful to you and that these are the ways that they can respect you. Um, uh, getting involved with LGBT organizations and local events, of course, and also watching for signs of bullying. Um, I think that's also really important because kids might not always communicate that they're being bullied. And so that brings me to this slide, which is sometimes you may not be aware about the harassment that your child might be experiencing. And so being able to have an open eye in terms of what it would look like if something was off uh, emotionally for your child, seeing any kind of um, specific changes in terms of their mood and watching for shifts in mood. Of course, we want to be watching for this vigilantly, but also not intrusively. So, you know, I definitely don't recommend constantly checking in and asking a million questions, but um, just really being able to have an open conversation about this and to maybe establish, you know, as Dr. Avila was saying, having a plan for how to talk about this, having a plan for having regular check-ins about this and maybe scheduling a check-in about this, saying, hey, um, you know, maybe once a month or so, we're gonna have just a boba date. Um, it's like more popular thing now, the boba dates. <laughs> having a boba date and we're just gonna, I'm just gonna check in with you about this. Um, because some of these you might be able to observe, like you might be noticing if your child is, um, experience, 
is, is having loss of interest or social withdrawal, that they're not really wanting to go out anymore. They're not really wanting to hang out with friends anymore. They're not really wanting to go to school in the morning or feeling less energetic um, or having difficulty concentrating and seeing those grades start to drop a little bit with those difficulties concentrating, hearing feedback from teachers. Um, but other ones you might not be able to notice so much, um, like the persistent sadness, um, or the frequent worries. Those might be things that kids might be experiencing inside but not really feeling open to share. And so having some time to really talk about that and, and prepare to talk about that and sometimes having a scheduled time where you're just saying, hey, we're just going to check in about these things can be a helpful way to get some insight um, into that. And just if I can go back up to that top one, irritable mood is oftentimes something that gets missed because we just, that's you know, to kind of close the loop on, on all of this, that's something that sometimes gets blamed on the hormones. Um, you know, it's just the hormones are they're just, uh, you know, being irritable and just talking back and all of that. But actually, in, in adolescence and even in some of the time before adolescence, irritability and having a, a um, you know, being quick to snap, having a little bit of a short fuse, those are also signs and symptoms of depression. Um, that also might be the way that depression and anxiety is manifesting. So um, when you do experience that your child might be a little bit more irritable, a little bit more quick to, to um, snap at you. Don't dismiss that as necessarily just the hormones, but really pay attention to some of these other factors and see if you're seeing any of these other changes as well. And that maybe instead of just presenting in a way where they persistently look sad, um, depression might be presenting in a way that's a little bit different and a little bit easier to ignore uh, or a little bit easier to punish um, rather than to stop and listen and see what's really going on. So, oops, it's not what I wanted to do. Oh, there we go. So last but not least, getting help early is essential. Um, when I have conversations with kids at the gender clinic, I, you know, one of the first times that we meet kids, we automatically recommend that they see a therapist. Um, that can be a little bit challenging sometimes, especially since hi historically therapists have seen, um, or, you know, within mental health communities, differences in gender and sexuality has kind of, have kind of been defined as pathological and been labeled in a pathological way and so, uh, and been treated in a way that we might say this is wrong and we want to change it. And so sometimes, uh, recommending that somebody go to a therapist because they're struggling with their identity development can feel a little bit off-putting, um, but that's not at all um, the reason that we recommend that children see therapists or adolescents see therapists or families as a whole see therapists when they're navigating all of this. The reason that we recommend it is because of the fact that you have those three tiers of minority stress that you're going through. And that's just something that you might be experiencing above and beyond um, some of your pe or what some of your peers might be experiencing. And so really it's about trying to figure out how to build resiliency against those factors and how to find a way for you to be yourself, to be able to um, explore and develop that identity in a way that feels right to you and to be able to do it despite some of these stressors that you're navigating in society. And sometimes that can be pretty difficult to do alone. And one of the other major recommendations that I always give on the first time that I'm meeting somebody is also to find those opportunities for social support. Because a therapist can be incredibly helpful in terms of building that resiliency and navigating that stress, especially tailoring that to your specific family. But sometimes your therapist might not know what it's like for you to experience this identity. And it might be more beneficial for you to also be talking to other peers that have similar um, identities or that have had similar experiences in exploring and understanding their identity. And that can provide pretty invaluable support in terms of being able to connect with somebody and get some more feedback about their experiences and support each other. Stanford does not currently offer one. Um, it's something that we're hoping to develop. Um, so there's not currently a LGBTQ specific support group, um, but there are support groups in the community through Outlet, um, in you know, San Mateo Pride Center, um, at their support groups, Youth, youth Space, space yeah. support groups in San Jose, yeah. Um, so there are a variety, but yeah, unfortunately, that's something that we're still um, figuring out and, and to develop. Um, and last but not least, making changes when necessary. Um, sometimes, um, because of all of the misconceptions about development and thinking that kids are not in a place where they can really make decisions for themselves in terms of their identity, that's um, 
That's often something that happens with LGBTQ kids. It doesn't ever happen really with uh, heterosexual or cisgender kids. Nobody really tells them, you're not sure that you, you know, if you're a girl, you're not sure that you like boys. You just have to kind of wait it out and see what you think. Uh, or you're not sure that you're um, cisgender, just wait it out, you might be trans. Um, that's not something that cisgender or heterosexual kids hear very often, but it's something that LGBTQ kids hear quite often, uh, and it can be, pretty um, patronizing in terms of you know them understanding who they are and sometimes they may not fully understand who they are but they may be at a place where they understand that uh, their development looks pretty different than some of their cisgender or heterosexual peers and they need some time to figure it out and so um, providing the space to do that is really important but if your child is really really distressed because of this identity um, the, the conflict in terms of understanding who they are or is very certain about who they are and experiencing a really high level of distress waiting and providing them more time to continue figuring it out or waiting and providing more time so that they can just make this decision in a more adult way can actually do more harm um, it's not you know it's sometimes it's been called the wait and see approach uh, and actually that can um, create a, a time when changes happen and when more uh, mental health concerns start to develop and um, re increase the risk in terms of the um, mental health outcomes. So making changes when necessary to try to help your child find some relief in the moment and navigating what's a realistic change right now that would be appropriate for that child can be a really, really critical way of getting them the help that they need and preventing um, further issues in terms of their anxiety, their depression, um, and just their overall well-being and development. Okay. Well, thank you for um, coming, and please fill out the uh, questionnaire surveys that you have as well. Thank you, guys.